Let's begin the Renaissance with Filippo Brunelleschi. He was an Italian sculptor who goes over to become an architect and an inventor. He's truly a Renaissance man, capable in many fields, and I strongly suspect that Brunelleschi was also a genius. You're looking at a sculpture of him to made to honor him as he's placed in Florence looking up at the great dome that he is most famous for creating. This is Florence Cathedral. This one you do have in volume one, so you can actually see this. It's 1419 in our textbook. And this is the incredible dome uh, right on top, rather large and rather impressive. That was created by Brunelleschi. Uh, before we get to Brunelleschi's dome, let's take a look at the church itself at the cathedral, which helps to span the time period from the 13th century, which is clearly Gothic, to the period of the Renaissance when Brunelleschi is adding the dome. This huge cathedral is typical of churches that were designed in the Middle Ages, particularly we're talking Gothic period beginning 13th century. It often took centuries to complete them. So it ends up being a kind of eclectic construction. The body of the building itself, and that would be this here, is actually Gothic in design, at least Italian Gothic. The bell tower next to it was designed by Giotto, so that's coming later, and is Proto-Renaissance, and then the Great Dome by Brunelleschi is fully Renaissance. Let's take a look at the side view to get an appreciation of what the Gothic designers had in mind when they created this building. Immediately you recognize that this doesn't look anything like a French Gothic construction. It's built in the Gothic period, but it is so uniquely Italian that we usually describe it as Italian Gothic. It doesn't borrow much from the French. It, for one thing, rejects the use of flying buttresses. The Italians, in fact, thought that buttresses were barbaric looking, so they didn't want anything to do with them. What that means is the walls of Italian churches ended up being very solid, but also very massive and heavy. Because we lack the buttresses that the French were using, we also have to keep the windows very small, so that reduces the light that is going inside but it does allow the walls to support the roof of the massive building. The walls are solid, the walls are flat, and what the Italians have chosen to do was to cover them with marble. So it's encrusted with marble. This is a very Italian approach to architecture. We saw the Romans do it, for example, with the Pantheon, covering lesser materials with finer ones, putting a veneer on the surface. Here you can see that the surface decoration consists of a series of repeated geometric shapes, so it has a kind of order to it, a kind of fundamental geometric underpinning of design. The forms then do not merge together as French Gothic churches do. They remain simple geometric shapes, clearly defined as individual units and with clear outlines as well. That in this case adds to a sense of solidity, of clarity and monumentality. Those are elements of taste that will continue in the period of the Italian High Renaissance. This church also has a remarkable horizontal emphasis. Okay, we go along the horizontal rather than as French Gothic using lines that would direct our eye upward. So this monumental, this very big church seems to hug the earth without an upward thrust, thrust um, despite its immense size as it dwarfs everything else in the city of Florence. When the Gothic designers created the plans for this building, they did something really revealing. They had in mind a glorious, very large scale dome to cover the monumental building that they were putting up in their city. However, they had no clue in the world how they were going to build such a big dome spanning such a large space. 
what they did was something very typical of the Middle Ages, of the Gothic period. They said, God will allow us to work it out. God will show us the way. God will give us the plan. It is this medieval attitude that we have to rely on God. God will take care of us. God will direct us. Not the attitude that it is a human being who will do the creating or come up with the design on his own. In fact, by the time we get to the Renaissance, we will discover that it is an individual, and his name is Brunelleschi, and he will create the design for the dome as part of a contest. And I want to stress that. In 1418, uh, the Florentines will decide that it's really time to put a dome on this church. So they allow artists and architects to submit designs and the fathers of Florence, the city fathers basically, go over these designs and pick the one that they think is best. The reason that's important, we're back to the days of individual achievement and competition. This was done as a contest to see who is the best and who can come up with the best design. In this case, the winner was Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi is an important individual for the Italian Renaissance. He helps to establish Renaissance style for architecture. He's also going to invent perspective, which is not too shabby. And we know something about this guy. He was short. He was bald. He was bad-tempered. We hear he didn't wash regularly, and he never married. The reason he never married, we're told, is that a wife would hinder your work. You know, if you're a genius, a wife and a family would tie you down too much. However, we also know that this guy was completely brilliant. Why does this description of Brunelleschi matter at all? Well, it matters because in the Renaissance, we start to care again about the achievement of the individual. So we have the names of artists, the names of architects, and we actually have descriptions of them and of their work so that we have returned to the time when the achievement of the individual matters. And that's going to be definitely true for Brunelleschi. The real challenge to creating a design for a dome to cover this building was the span, the distance of the span. In other words, the diameter, essentially, of the construction of the dome. If you cut across the octagonal, or you can think circular shape, the diameter across this, uh, was 144 feet. It was a large space to span with a single dome. Brunelleschi looked back to the ancients to study their work, and in particular he looked at the Pantheon, which had a span of 142 feet. And one of the things that appealed to Brunelleschi was competing with the ancients to see if, in fact, he could not come up with a design that would allow him to out do the ancients and to create a dome that would cover uh, an even larger span, a span of 144 feet. He succeeds. He comes up, up with a system that will allow him to build this dome beginning up in the air, right about at this level, 280 feet up in the air, causing the top of the dome right up to this level right there to rise to 350 feet. Then he caps it with a lantern rising to 375 feet up in the air. All of this is weighing around 37,000 tons and it was made out of over 4 million bricks. So this is a brick dome. There is nothing like this in terms of height until we get to the 20th century and then people are building with modern materials, with new materials. This is so high up in the air it has already been struck by lightning and required repair. So the question I guess is how did this man do this? Well he did it by embracing a double shelled dome.
This approach was the first time an architect had ever done this in the West, and what it accomplished is to lighten the load of the dome. And this is probably something that he did learn a little bit about from studying the Pantheon. There is an inner shell of masonry and an outer shell of tile. So think of two layers to this dome with an empty space between them. In that empty space, Brunelleschi designed a web of ribs, vertically moving and horizontally moving. And we're looking at, in my diagram, that web of ribs right over here that would function essentially as a buttressing system to support the dome and maintain its position upright. This was a brilliant solution and it is the reason that Brunelleschi was the winner of the contest to complete the dome. He will add eight strong ribs and that's what these are creating geometric divisions on the exterior of the dome in order to support it, basically acting a little bit like buttresses, to help the dome maintain its shape. These ribs were held in position by linking them up to the lantern at the very top of this. So a brilliant solution to a difficult architectural problem rising out of the complexity of the architectural design below, which is purely Gothic, and I'm talking about this region down here, transitioning in the drum of the dome into continued geometric shapes, but making them larger so that there's a little less busyness going on, and then moving up to the dome with stronger individual, larger simplified geometric shapes and forms making the overall dome appear very monumental and very, very grand from a distance. As if that wasn't enough, Brunelleschi also invented perspective, and this was based on empirical observation. We believe that he went to Rome, where he made a series of drawings of ancient buildings, studying the antique, the Romans in particular. And as he did that, he began to realize that he could apply a system to make his drawings appear accurate and three-dimensional. The system we refer, refer to as linear perspective, and it is a system where you can take a two-dimensional surface, a flat painted surface, for example, or a wall, something flat, and you can actually create the illusion that it is three-dimensional, that it moves in space. It is based upon the knowledge that all parallel lines in a unified vision field will recede or appear to recede, getting closer and closer together in the distance until they actually seem to disappear at a quote-unquote vanishing point. And this kind of thing is pretty easy actually once you know perspective, but pretty easy to actually see. This is one right here, one of Brunelleschi's church designs that he built himself. If you look at the tiling on the floor and you take a straight edge and you file, follow the lines of the tile back into the distance, all of those lines appear to get closer and closer and closer together until they vanish at a single point. The same is going to be true if you follow the coffering down from the ceiling and it doesn't matter where you go, you can pick any line you want, everything is going to recede at a single vanishing point. When you drive your car next time, look at the road ahead of you and you can see the two sides of the road seeming to converge together, getting closer and closer until they meet at a single vanishing point. This was an astonishing gift for artists, for painters particularly, because it allowed them then to create very convincing space within their paintings.